Okay. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, attending our class today. Um, uh, we have uh, elite group inspections that's going to be hosting a, a, a session going over the Big 12. So with further ado, let's go ahead and uh, hand it over to Dustin and uh, he'll look, go ahead and start the, the class. Dustin, yeah, I can. There is it. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Back on track. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm assuming out there in Zoom land, you guys can hear me? Uh-oh. They, they hear you. They do? Okay, excellent. All right, everybody. Well, good afternoon. Hope everybody's having a, a powerful Wednesday. My name is Dustin Smith. I'm the territory manager for the Elite Group. I handle Los Angeles County, Riverside County, and San Bernardino County. Elite as a company, we actually go ahead and we service from Fresno down to the Mexican border seven days a week. Seven days a week. Um, also, all 80 of my inspectors are actually um, cleared and checked by car. So the same institution that's given you your licensing has gone ahead and background checked all 80 of my inspectors. We're the only company in California that has that uh, designation. So it's good to know that they've gone ahead and you can trust them at these properties should you have to leave or, or whatever it may be. Um, outside of just going ahead and doing property inspection, we do sewer cameras, roof certifications, mold detection, uh, termite. We have a thing called a repair pricer, which is a secondary report we can go ahead and have put together for you post inspection. And we'll go ahead and give you the estimated cost to go ahead and fix the problems that we found during the inspection, giving you more time to do money making activities, door knocking, working your farm, whatever it may be, open houses. So the idea here with Elite is that we're actually, uh, we try to be a one stop shop, if you will. Uh, today, what we're going to do is go over the Big 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. What the Big 12 refers to, these are the 12 problems that we run into every single year, and these cannot be repaired. They have to be replaced. So the idea here is that on the selling side, we can go ahead and be a little more educated about what we're getting ourselves into and what our clients are getting themselves into. On the selling side, we can go ahead and get in front of the problem. So if there's an issue, we can go, hey, this could come up and affect the price, and you can decide at that point if you want to go ahead and take care of these issues or go ahead and understand that if these issues are brought up, these are not repairable items, but in fact, you'd have to go ahead and um, replace the entire unit, depending on what it is. Uh, it is an open forum class. So what that means is if you have any questions or comments, you just shout them out at me. Don't worry about it. Uh, if you have to get up and take a phone call or whatever you need, don't worry about it. No ego on this side of it. I'm here to bring some value in chicken. And I've already done one of those things, right? You have your chicken, except for you Zoomers. I apologize. You got to come by next time. So with that said, we're going to jump in. And again, if you guys have any questions at all, uh, anecdotes, things you'd like to share, please, please do. Uh, I find out in these classroom settings, sometimes people get a little uh, nervous or shy and they want to talk to me after. So I will be here after for a little bit as well. But just think about it this way. If there's a question you have, I bet you someone else has that same question. So if neither one of you ask it, I can't answer it, right? So... Please, let's go ahead and make sure everyone feels like they're very much a part of this, and uh, we'll jump into it from there. Sound good? Yeah, good? All right, excellent. So one of the biggest problems that we run into, um, this is going to be more in like the craft homes or homes that are, that are much older, is single wire aluminum. Um, it's a pretty easy to go ahead and spot. I mean, literally, it's a single wire. And the problem here is that this wire, it was installed for about 20 years before they started seeing the problems. And the problem is, is as it expands and it contracts, it ends up going ahead and getting a loose fitting. When a loose fitting happens with a wire, it over time will pull out and now we get open arcing, which is basically an open stream of electricity going from the wire to the, uh, to, to the product. In this case would be the end uh, fit piece. This can go ahead and actually short out the entire home. It can also go ahead and melt sockets in the wall. Uh, they didn't know about this for about 15 years. I believe it's up, yeah, from 65 to 74, it was considered completely fine, not a problem. And then we started seeing larger issues as it was done on a larger scale. So if a house is built between those years, you definitely want to go ahead and take a look and, and at the report that we put together for you, or even as you're walking, doing your AVID. Um, obviously, with your AVID, you shouldn't be going too, in too much investigation. Uh, you don't want to go outside of the spectrum that you have to go out of. But if you see the single wire, there will be an issue. We will go ahead and put in our reports as well. And I brought a report to show you guys in a little bit here, so you can get an idea of exactly how we'd go ahead and classify it and just how easy it is to use an elite report to go ahead and find the problems that we found. So the aluminum wiring, uh, the other problem we have here is if houses have been remodeled during that time. So if you have a house that was built before 65, but between 65 and 74 it was renovated, 
there's a strong chance that they use single wire aluminum, uh, aluminum wire then, and that's an issue. So what we want to do now is we want to go here to what they call a piggy pigtailing, and that's when they're going to get several pieces of aluminum wire, put them together, and now they're going to go ahead and they're going to fit into that joint much better because as they expand and contract because they're tied to each other, there isn't as much movement. So we're not going to go ahead and start to see that wire slip out of its casing and get that open arc of electricity. We're not going to see that any longer. So it's completely fine, but as you can see in some of these pictures, when it's not going ahead and taken care of, this is some of the damage that we see. So for example, this last picture here, I know it's a little covered up because of the zoom, but you can actually see that it melted the sockets out. And the problem again there was as it contracted and expanded and became loose, it was unregulating the amount of electricity that was shooting through the house. And it was also going ahead and conducting different parts of the home, which would be to overheating and you'd see plastic meltage like that. So this is not a tough, something that we need to really go ahead and lose our heads on. Um, aluminum wiring is still not a problem. It, it's a great, it's a great conductor. It's a great way to use electricity, but we definitely want to go ahead and see it braided now, because again, that braid will hold tighter and we're not going to have the chance of slippage, which will then give us an open arc. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you guys are, get bored or if you have any questions, you got to let me know too, because I do this all the time. So I don't know, you know, this is one of these things. I got to make sure you guys get, get value out of this. Okay. Yes. Can you see this aluminum wiring? Anything. It's going to depend how it was done in the house. Usually not. Is that's the difference. So you might see that the fuse box, like this first picture was at the fuse box. Eventually you'll get there, I promise. So like this is like at the fuse box outside. So if you I don't that's the thing is you know, whatever your broker says, I never want to go and override them. Some brokers don't mind you opening the box, other brokers prefer you leave it alone. So I would consult with your broker prior to going ahead, because that's another thing too, is with your avid. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty wide open for how much, how deep you have to go into as an inspection company, we're expected to go ahead and go a little bit deeper and a little bit further, but, um, as an agent, you really want to walk that line a little bit. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you're not really expected to go ahead and check out the electrical, but again, go by your broker every single time. Um, I wouldn't search for it per se. Um, but if you were to see it, that's the thing you're going to see is if we go back to that picture. So, so here's a break, right? So you see multiple strands of that wiring. And then you see here in this picture, it's, it's pretty obvious, but it's just a single strand. And that's what it will look like. It's just a single strand of aluminum. It will have a certain casing depending on how they want you to go and position it when it's being inst uh, installed, <clears throat> excuse me. But if you see that single wiring, that would be an issue. And another reason I don't think it's a great idea to go ahead and try to find it for yourself is because once you go ahead and you find that, one, you have to disclose it, but two is how much do you really know about it? And can you answer the questions that are coming at you? And that's the problem is a lot of times you get in this position, we think we're being really helpful, but we're getting off of our realtor status, we're going somewhere else, and now we put ourselves in liabilities way, right? So for example, the biggest one is that four little word mold. People will always go ahead and, you know, I see it on the avids all the time, found mold. It's like, well, you don't know what that is. So you should probably go ahead and say, you know, organic growth or irregular staining. Let someone come in who's actually paid to go ahead and, and manufacture those kinds of reports. So the liability slips to, slips to us or slips to them. So again, yeah, if you ever see it, it's gonna be wide open. It's gonna be understandable to see it. But I doubt in your avid, um, the average that I've been a part of, um, you probably wouldn't go that deep into it, but that is something if you saw on the report and now you would understand if you're on the buying side, that's probably a good time to go ahead and say, we should pull an electrician in and have the electrician be the one to explain to them your single wiring should be replaced. You want to keep yourself uh, clear of that because if you accidentally say the wrong thing, it can be used against you. And it's unfortunate that's part of this transaction. And you as realtors don't have a lot of, a lot of shields around you. You guys pretty much operate with a huge open uh, liability window. So we want to make sure we don't go ahead and dance into that part of the uh, transaction. Yes. I have a question because they always know, and I, it's a little bit different than this, but the plugs that near water, can you explain that a little bit? There's a certain plug that you need in the kitchen or GFR. the bathroom. Oh, GFR. yeah. So just to, before you ask that, when from back here, the people on Zoom will not be able to hear the question, but the people that you Oh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so the first question was, um, how often would you guys see aluminum wiring or, you know, is it easy to find the single aluminum wiring? And the short answer is no. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot deeper than your avid would ask you to go ahead and do. So I wouldn't search for it. Um, but again, if it's in the report, we can go ahead and address it then. But I doubt you're going to see it on your regular avid walkthroughs. The question after that was about GFIs. And that is something we test for in all of the, uh, all of the um, outlets. So we actually have a machine that will go ahead, plug in, and it'll let us know if the GFI itself. It's basically a trip switch that'll go ahead and show electricity off to the uh, actually outlet if it feels like there's too much power or too much of a surge coming into it. We do test for that throughout the homes. Where is it required though? Is there a requirement? We don't do anything. To, yeah, so we, no. so the answer again was, uh, the, the question there was, um, is it required? 
And I do believe is required in some places, but at the yeah. elite group, we do yeah. not go ahead and check to any kind of city code or any municipality. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, we have to go ahead. So what we go by is Internachi, which is the person or the company rather that's given us our certifications. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And then our insurance policy. We carry $2 million insurance policy on every job we do, which is important because in California, um, um, home inspection is unregulated. So anyone can be a home inspector. You don't have to have a license because there's not, there's not one to get and you don't have to carry insurance. So if you guys ever go ahead and say, hey, let's work with ABC inspections. I don't think that's a real company, by the way. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to smear any dirt. <laughs> but let's say you get ABC inspections and they come in and they create a problem. Um, if they decide they don't want to go ahead and have to pay for that problem, you dragged into court, they would just file bankruptcy and then open up a new company under a different name. At Elite, we have $1 million of e &O insurance. So errors and admissions, should we go ahead and make a mistake, <clears throat> excuse me, or miss something, we can take care of it internally. And we also carry a million dollars of workers' comp. So should one of my inspectors fall off of a roof or get hurt at a home, we wouldn't turn around and sell the seller, we take care of it. So that's our way of trying to give you guys a little bit of cushion and making sure everything inspection-wise comes to us and keeps you guys in the realtor lane and we stay in the inspection lane. But back to the GFIs, uh, yeah, basically we're gonna test for those everywhere, but again, not to code, we're just making sure that they work and they would be notated if they did not work in the report as well. Thank you. Excellent. Any more questions about aluminum wiring? I mean, it's pretty easy, right? If you see one, it's not good. If you, if you see that single wire, that's not something we're looking for. We wanna go ahead and see what they call a piggy braid. Um, I don't know why they call it a piggy braid, maybe because like the tail of a pig, I guess. <laughs> so either way, that's what you wanna see. Um, aluminum wiring is not a problem. So it's not like, okay, well, I don't want aluminum wiring because it's an issue. It's only an issue when it's a singular wire that expands and contracts too much in order to keep that nice taut uh, space <laughs> with the conductor so we don't get that arcing electricity. Yes. So how much, uh, uh, just how much you calculation, how much can you repair? Oh, so, well, if, if the whole house is aluminum wire single, you have to rewire the whole house. So that's gonna get down to you. Now we're looking at the way that it's set up where the power line's coming off of and the square footage. Yeah, so that one I can't give a number on. So like, this is how I was just saying, everyone kind of stays there. I don't want to be the one to tell you guys X amount of dollars. And the next thing you know, it's double that, right? So it's going to depend who you work with. I have a ton of referrals. Um, at the Elite Group, we don't work with anybody um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We give out referrals just because it's a conflict of interest. If every time we got a kickback that I give Tony's electricity a job, every, every time around Christmas, I'm going to start giving a lot of jobs so these kids can get those expensive toys to break, right? So that's what we want to do is I can give you referrals about that. But as far as price, on um, this entire presentation, I am um, I have one item that I do know the price of to repair, um, and that's about it. But these ones like electricity, it's all over the place, and it's dependent on the home itself. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So then, expansive soil. This is something that we see a lot of uh, where there's drilling and a lot of in the high desert. So expansive soil is like a sponge. So just imagine if you were going to build uh, a little model of a home on top of a sponge. When the sponge is dry, that home can sit there no problem. Once the sponge gets wet, it starts to sag a little bit. And now there's no, there's no even place for everything to go ahead and stimulate to the actual sponge surface. That's the same thing with expansive soil. So this is expansive soil and it's a dry state. So once it dries up, that's actually what it does. It does not stay together. It'll go ahead and start to have massive cracks throughout, meaning that it cannot go ahead and support anything singularly. Um, then when it gets wet, it goes ahead and it expands. It'll now become one solid piece that will go ahead and actually move out with, with greater with greater distance between these. So every time it expands and contracts, these cracks here actually are different sizes when it's done. So basically what we have here is something we cannot build on or should not build on. Um, this is something you'd have to go ahead and have a soil expert come out to go ahead and take a look at. We can go ahead and tell you signs of what's happening, but realistically, you're gonna have to have someone who specializes in geo land tracking basically to come out and take a look to give you an idea. Expansive soil tends to be in pockets. So it's rare that you're going to have a whole neighborhood under expansive soil, but you may have areas here and there. And the way that we can tell is the way that the house starts to stress. Once the house starts to stress and we start to see cracks or breaking at parts of the home that have been reinforced, forced rather, we know we have a push and pull effect. And that's usually the first sign to us that we have some kind of soil issue. Not every time, but a lot of the times that's the issue. So taking a look here is a diagram. I think it explains it a little more clearly. This first picture shows expansive soil. So you see the gray rectangle that are going around, that would be the foundation. Then we have the foundation wall. You see where the expansive soil is, which is kind of that red area. So as it expands and it contracts, it puts too much pressure on that part of the actual foundation, which will start cracking. Once it starts to crack, as it gets larger and larger, that crack itself and the way that the push and pull is happening will expand to the physical home itself, not just to the base of the foundation. The second picture here is a really good depiction of what could start happening. 
because it was brick, it kind of broke in that, in that clearer pattern. But we know right here, we can see some problems because the corner of the house tends to be the place we don't see a ton of cracks starting, at least from the foundation aspect. The second one, which I got to uncover, give me one second to move okay, this. Minimize button on the very top where it says view. Minimize that. Oh, okay. Oh, either way, it'll work right there. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, oh, maybe not. Can you the video where you're at? Yeah, yeah, there's a minus sign. On top of the video? Oh, up here. Yep, right. Yeah. And I don't see it. Right below you. Right below right you. Right a little bit down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right here. You have to do it on that one. Oh, it's on, oh, okay. Use your mouse. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, right. There you go. Oh, no, it won't go. It goes behind it, see? <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay, but we can get around it. I've had bigger problems within this. So another problem that we can see here um, that's up in this corner where this thing is. Whoa, what is going on? We're all over the place. There we go. Okay, so this last picture here, this is a great sign to us that we have some kind of movement in the foundation of the home. When you see a home built and it's just the wood, do you ever notice how much wood they put around all the doors? The same place they tell us during earthquakes, Gamma needs to do it. It's the strongest part of the house, the door frame, the door frame. So the door frame is not built to move. The door frame is built to stay, to stay in stationary the entire time the house is there. There's gonna be a lot of pressure on it with the hinges from the door. It is meant not to move. When we start to see cracks at the edges of these doors, that's how we're starting to tell that there's a lot of movement inside of the structure of the house itself. Now, if it's a crack in the drywall, that's not a huge deal. But when we get an invasive crack is what we call this, that's actually when the drywall is separating from itself. So this isn't just a crack. You could actually go ahead and with that, we couldn't put a pencil through there, but you could put a file through there and start to hit the wood. The actual studs themselves, because what's happening is the studs themselves are starting to move a little bit and there is no move in that drywall. Drywall is completely affixed to the uh, distance it's going to be on. You never build drywall with the idea that it's going to move. So when we start to see this, this is another example of what can happen. Uh, and this would be, again, because it's, con it's contracting and expanding, contracting and expanding. And that lets us know there's going to be an issue here. So we're, when this comes here, the further analysis you want to go ahead is to get a soil engineer. The soil engineer would be able to come in and take a look. I'm not exactly sure how they do what they do, but they're the ones that can give you a, an official report to let you know if expansive soil is considered an issue. Uh, the two ways that they can go around it is one, they can go ahead and reinforce the areas that are moving. Or two is they can actually go in and try to uh, replace the soil itself with a non-expansive material. Um, either way, it's going to depend on the home, the age of the home, and then obviously the budget of the person who's deciding to go ahead and take care of the issue. Uh, again, we see this a lot like in the South Bay where we see a lot of those oil derricks and out in the high desert, we see a lot of this as well. Um, there's always seismic activity. You know, it's going to happen. Palm Springs, this is something we see quite often as well. Um, and again, that's part of what's going to happen when you live in a seismic uh, activity area like you do in Southern California. Any questions about that? No, all right. All right, so polybutyrate piping. Uh, this actually was a pretty big problem. Uh, it was back between 78 and 95 is when this was being used in the, instead of using copper piping. The reason was is because we started to see a lot more expansion of these, as they say, cookie cutter neighborhoods where, you know, there's three different models all throughout and they build, you know, several hundred homes. But what they were doing was going ahead and trying to cut corners. And one of the ways to cut corners was to go ahead and uh, instead of using the copper piping, was to go ahead and use this uh, polyethylene piping. And the reason they used it is because it was malleable. So, for example, if you had to go ahead and run copper piping from the floor to the second, from the first floor to the second floor, you're going to have to have the piping that goes straight on the bottom floor. You have to buy the elbow piece, which is separate, and then the additional um, piece that's going to stand horizontal or vertical, rather, uh, to let, let the water pass through the home. With the poly D piping, what they can do is they can actually bend it a little bit. So they're able to save money by not going in and having to buy different pieces. They could run it longer and they could just cut it when they had to. So even if you look at this picture here, you can actually see that it's slightly bent on top. The pipe that's coming down, it's actually bending just a little bit to the left. The next problem that was had with this piping is that they still use copper couplings. Well, the copper couplings have to be clamped on with a tool and the tool and the coupling were meant to go ahead and go around brass, but they still put them around plastic. And what happened is we had some loose joints and then over time, we started to see the decay go a little faster. What happens when these pipes burst is they actually don't go ahead and get pinholes. They get long cuts and it will dribble out slowly. So it can take a long time to figure out that you actually have a leak with this kind of piping. The recall ended up happening as well, where it is, yeah, it's a billion dollar, a billion dollar class lawsuit. Because like I said, between 78 and 95, I think they're over 10 million, right? 
yes, about 10 million homes had this kind of piping. And it's not a matter of if, but when it was going to leak. This next slide here will show you some of the damage that happens to the pipe itself. So over time, what will happen is the chemical reaction to the water will start to go ahead and decay the pipe. And as you can see in this slide here, that cut is actually how it starts to break apart. It isn't like the movies like or the dam where it spouts out big time. You're going to actually see these cuts. And you can see here that the top of that on the second picture, the top of that cut is just starting to skew out a little bit. And then we can see here that the copper is actually leaking around the copper uh, clamps as well. And the big problem here was that the clamp itself was faulty as well, even with it being used on copper itself. So now you have a faulty clamp being used on an improper uh, material as well, which has gone ahead and led to a ton of issues. We don't see this all the time, but when we see it, it's an instant red flag for us. Because at that point now, we know we cannot go ahead and give warranty to any of the plumbing because we don't know exactly how much of this is used throughout the house. Because we're going to see, usually we're gonna see it um, either underneath the house or possibly by the water heater. Uh, so the chances it's used throughout the home are very high. Uh, what sometimes what builders have done is when this piping would come off of the wall, they would actually put a large black cover over it just so you couldn't see the white pipe because then you would know that obviously it was the incorrect material was used in. Uh, this is something here that has to be replaced 100%. Even if, in my, in my opinion, if I was going to purchase a home and I saw this and there wasn't any signs of, of leakage or anything along that line, I would still be very concerned about it. Because again, like I said, it's not a matter of if, but when it will go ahead and fail. And because of the way that it leaks out, you can have this leaking for months at a time before you really know. So unless you're really on top of your water bill or there's obvious signs of puddling, it's going to be tough to catch these until there's been some other problem that's, that's arrived from it whether it's wood rot, um, maybe you're gonna go ahead and get the balloon. The balloon is, you've ever seen when water comes out of a ceiling and it kind of sags? It's actually the paint, the latex paint holding that, that water. So those are things that we can find out eventually, but by the time it's gone that far, we know there's been a lot of damage. So the PV piping, there's really no way to go ahead and, and know what it is. It will say it on there sometimes, it'll say PV piping or polybutherin piping. But again, as an agent, I don't know how far you wanna get into this. Um, it's one of those things, it's more, uh, hopefully what you learn here, if you see it in the report, it'll give you a little bit of an idea of how to go about it. Um, but I wouldn't search for this. I doubt you guys would see this on your own doing your AVID. But if it is discovered, it is a red line item. And a red line item means that Elite will not give any warranty on it at all. And will recommend that in, in this particular case, a plumber comes out and takes a look to give you a better idea of what you're dealing with. So that's the kind of information that we want to make sure that kind of language that we're going to use with you that we would use with your client as well. So if your client says, oh, why is this in red? And we'd explain to them, that's a pipe that tends to go ahead and have leaks and issues and problems. Recommend a plumber comes in to give you a better estimate of exactly what you're looking at to make this work correctly. So we're not looking to scare anybody, but we wanna make sure they're aware of the issue. And then again, on the selling side, this would help them out as well uh, from any kind of litigation post sell of the house. Because if they're gonna say, well, did you know this was there? Did you have this there? And now it's who said, she said, and they're waiting for the sellers to slip up and say, well, I know that it was this, just to find a way to go ahead and, and continue litigation now. So that's why if we see it, we want to address it immediately and we'll make sure it's in a red line on the report. And I know that I'm off camera, you guys can't hear me, just give me a second. I'm going to pass this around. This is a sample report, but this gives you an idea. On the second page, we're going to tell you what page and what paragraph you can find out what we found wrong with the home. So I always recommend that agents read the report. It doesn't always happen, but I would always recommend you read it. And at the very least, at the very least, read the page, the summary page that says everything that's wrong. It's going to say page 67, paragraph four. Go there, read it. And then another thing too, I think is a great idea is to go over the report with your client, the summary report, put together a list of questions, and then let's set up a conversation after that. And what we can do is um, on the front of our reports, the actual inspector who was at your property, their phone number and email is on there. So we can set up that second conversation, whether it's a Zoom, a phone call, a million texts back and forth, uh, lunch, whatever is going to take to make sure that clarity is provided. Because it is our biggest goal at the elite group is obviously we wanna go ahead and make sure we give the most complete, clear and concise report. We wanna make sure everybody's questions are answered, that everybody understands. And we really wanna take that away from you as the realtor, because sometimes you guys get put in corners because they want an answer right now and they're upset and you wanna go ahead and service them. But by doing that, you may go ahead and give bad information unknowingly, which down the road could be a bigger problem. Let us go ahead and explain the report and then you can go ahead and kind of guide us on the other questions they may have. I think that's really the best way to go about it. new plastic plumbing stuff they're using now so there's a company so called that, yeah so. there's a company called trex there's another company called i think it's flex and yeah yeah that's a yes and that's what they're yeah so like for for example the trex company what they're doing is they're taking reclaimed plastic 
melting it down, and then they're making new pipes out of that. They also do decks. So we have seen a lot of that out there. We don't, I haven't had a ton of experience with it. I haven't had anything come up that's been a problem. Um, I haven't heard anything that's a problem with it yet, but it is a relatively new yeah, product. Yeah. So I think when we get some time out of there, I'm sure we'll find out if there's any issues or not. But um, as of right now, I've heard nothing negative about it. How long have they been doing those new plastic pipes? Well, approximate? Oh, know? I mean, well, Trek started it in like two, gosh, maybe 2001. They've been doing oh, it for, okay. so they've been yeah. around for at least 20 years. Trex has, yeah. The other company, the Flex Company, um, I, I, I just heard about them maybe two years ago, if oh, that, okay. it's very yeah. spotty. Because I have heard about it, and then, you know, there's all these differing opinions on this new plastic pipe, so I was just wondering. Yeah, I, I think for me, this have not been in, in process long enough to really get it. I heard nothing negative. I want to stress that. I've yeah. heard nothing negative. But, uh, you know, it takes about, you know, five, six, seven years, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, too, is going to be uh, decided on where the water's coming from. Is the water harder, softer, that kind oh, of thing? Yeah. Because we got to see what the chemical reaction is, which is the same thing that happened with those last pipes we just said. You know, they worked for about eight to ten years, it seemed like, with no issue. But then over time, the water was corroding them, and we found out because the chemicals in the water weren't meant to work with that plastic. Yes. So if that's a non-repairable uh, uh, aspect, what is PV replaced with? Copper. Copper. Ninety percent of the time, yeah. So that can be pricey. Absolutely, which is yeah. So the question was, if we have to go ahead and um, replace that PV piping, if I should go back, huh? So we actually see it. If we have to replace the PV piping, um, what would it be? What would you replace it with? And the answer was copper. Um, yeah, copper is the one 90 90% of the time. I've never really seen anything else outside of that when it comes to plumbing when it's going to be fixed. But that's the reason they use this is because it was so much cheaper than copper. And again, all they wanted it to do was to last for a certain amount of time, but they didn't know. I don't, I don't believe in their hearts of hearts they thought it was going to fail like this. Because um, I mean, I don't think anyone would want to lose $10 billion in a class action lawsuit. But if you're going to replace this piping, I don't. I've never met a uh, a plumber who wouldn't say immediately go to copper. If they really want to go ahead and, and budget's an issue, you can go to galvanize. But galvanize doesn't have a very long life. And galvanize, the problem there too is that galvanize will start to uh, corrode corrode from the inside, so you get brown water before you see anything on the outside of the pipe. So galvan, yeah, they use galvanize for a long time too. Now, is this only an issue on the water systems and not any other supplies? No, yeah, just for water. Yeah, so that's all. It's always in the PV is in use for. Yeah, for water or water system. For water, so water plumbing in the house. So you, you need to see water systems. What are you referring to? Well, I mean, well, because you're showing uh, uh, the water systems, but there any other water supply would be copper. Uh, yes. So this is the only kind of situation you would not have copper in. in Home, right? Usually, yeah, for yeah, water exactly. lines, for, water for water lines, yeah. But the problem here is that in the houses that have these, we rarely see a, a copper plastic combo. It's all, it's all the PV piping, which is why it gets so expensive, because now they've got to go ahead and replace all the PV piping. Uh, another problem too is that plastic and copper don't work together very well, which is kind of the problem we have here with the copper mm -hmm. linings. It doesn't work together over time, so we couldn't even go ahead and say, well, let's replace this much or this much. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think any plumber out there who's a good plumber wouldn't say. Either all of it or none of it. I can't touch it. I'm not going to just make certain parts here and here because then we're kind of just nickel and diming it. And then eventually you're going to pay for the entire the entire house to be copper over the next 10 years, but you're going to pay a lot more in service charges okay. to get it done. Yeah. What's the difference between that and PVC? So PVC is actually porous and it's more brittle. So PVC, the difference, yeah, the question was what's the difference between PVC? PVC it, yeah, it's yeah. no, no. So so PVC has a certain point where it snaps, it's very rigid. This can bend all day long. Yeah, this isn't, it's not going to be as thick as PVC, um, and it's not as porous as PVC. PVC is a little more porous as well. So PVC is a pretty low-end plastic, um, and it burns at a... better than PVC. Then. Well, it depends what you're using it for. This, this would be like this particular right here. I wouldn't use this for water ever. This is a, this, yeah, this is, this is a misused product. Yeah, PV was, polyurethane was never meant to be a water-carrying system. Yeah, they put it on PVC. They use that for like outside, like for your sprinklers and whatnot, because it's so strong, cheap, and it's easy to replace. So the outside system, they definitely have like irrigation and sprinkler systems, not that big of a deal. If you get a little break here and there, it's pretty easy to fix. But when this is behind a wall, that's the problem, is that when it leaks, again, because it's a slow leaker as well. So PVC pipe, I would, you could use pretty much for anything. It's a lower end quality, but even PVC, you wouldn't use that in your home. It's not ready for that kind of water. It's not ready for the chemicals that come out of gray water and black water. And over time, it'll just dissipate as well, become brittle and break. So are you saying that uh, you can replace, you need to replace the whole plumbing? Absolutely. Even though there's no, 
problem like that, you have to the whole, the whole system. I, I would, yes, I, me personally, yes. I mean, it's obviously up to the buyer, the seller, but in my advice, if I was an agent and someone said, what do you think we should do? I would say, I think you should go ahead and get, get it replaced because it's going to happen. So this isn't one of those things. It's like, oh, there's that one house that's had it for a hundred years. It will eventually start. And now we're and right now, if we went back, you can see the, the years that it was installed. I mean, we're at the, we're getting at the, so 95. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. So like 95 is pretty much when it stopped. So 95 is when the problems were discovered and that's when the, the, the uh, lawsuit came about. So now you're looking at that amount of time that's passed on a product that we know is probably going to fail. And now it's got 20 plus years of water running through it. Yeah, to me, it's just gonna be a bigger headache. I would definitely go ahead, at least get, at least get an estimate of what it would cost to have it replaced and then see if that's something the buyer or the seller are willing to work on. But I would definitely recommend personally. Now, I would never tell someone that if a buyer asked me on a report, well, what do you suggest I do? I would suggest you get a plumber involved and have the plumber go and discuss with you some options. Because I'm not a plumber, so I don't want to go ahead and paint that picture to them. Me personally, I would automatically put it in the copper. Yes. So, so to wrap this up, when you inspect a property and notice that it has a water system and you guys will only look for uh, detection of cracks, or would you recommend them to hire a plumber to inspect the whole water system? If we saw the PV? If you saw the PV. Yeah, immediately we put it red. We'd say you have PV system, recommend plumber comes in and take Regardless a look. Regardless if you see any damage. Regardless, yes. Anxiety. Because that's the thing is the day that it breaks could be the day that I leave. Right, right, right. And now it's on me because I said, oh, everything was totally fine. And then they call at three in the morning and they have no water. Yeah. So unfortunately, because of that, say it has to be. So that's again with these problems that we're going across. That's what we recommend replacement, but realistically, the industry would recommend replacement. And you would automatically not warranty that part of the inspection, right? Absolutely. Higher inspection. No, 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 just that part. Yeah, yeah. So anything that's in red. So I don't know if that report's making its ways around or not. If anyone has that report. Okay. But um, yeah, anything that's in red in our report does not get our warranty. Now, what you can do is if someone's like, well, hey, I'm going to fix it. Have you guys come back out? We can come back and amend the report. But yeah, yeah, anything in red, we will not go ahead and uh, and let our warranty be part. All right, consolidated industry premier heaters and furnaces. Uh, we don't see a ton of these. Um, they were back in, where is it out here? There we go. Yeah, 80s and 90s, these are somewhat pretty much uh, the, the use for. Uh, the problem is that they have these pens inside that actually are used to heat up the system itself. Well, the pens get so hot, they melt through the system. Once they melt through the system, they can cause fire if they hit open wood. They're extremely hot, like red, red hot. So basically they were recalled twice. Uh, the first recall was in the 90s, and there was a second recall where I, maybe it's in the next slide, but there was two different recalls in order to go ahead and get these off, uh, off the market. Um, there are, there was at one point some HVAC people who'd come out there and would replace the rods. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen anyone willing to do that. I think the liability is just too high because now if you see one of these consolidated furnaces, it's very old. I mean, like you said, the last one could have been put in the, in the early 90s, but the bottom line is that those pins still can heat up and actually melt through the system. So this is something, again, that if we saw this, we would recommend an HVAC specialist comes, but it would be a red line item for us automatically because there's no way I can stand behind a machine that has known to have issues within itself, let alone what it can do to the property. Uh, these are pretty easy to spot just because of their size. They almost look like a refrigerator on its side. Um, you know, you go to the newer systems now, they look nothing like this. I mean, it, it, looks, it looks the age that it is, uh, but the biggest problem here is the fire hazard. And then again, the fact that uh, some people did go ahead and have the rods replaced. Now, if the rods were replaced, there's nothing for us to work on there because we don't know if there's a warranty. I don't know who did it. There's nothing I can do about that. So even with the replaced system, I'm still going to go ahead and um, suggest that it's looked at further by a plumber or a heater, depending where it's located. And then they would go ahead and, my, my opinion, they tell you to go ahead and replace it. So we see more of these in larger homes. Uh, we see these in commercial all the time. Um, and they're still out there. There's still a ton of them out there. We actually have some pictures here that kind of show some of the different models. But you can see, I mean, you guys have seen enough houses and you walk around, if you saw something like this, that would stand out to you, I'm guessing. I've you seen just, one, it was crazy. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's, that's a, yeah, so, I mean, they're massive. It literally looks like a refrigerator. Yeah. So if you come across that, um, again, with us, it's gonna happen. And you see here the stainless steel box, which everything is, uh, is encompassed inside of. When the rods would get so hot, they'd melt through the actual steel box those rods were still hot enough to go ahead and burn into wood because a lot of these are in attics or even on even on roofs. So what's going to happen? Anything it touches could go ahead and catch fire. It's a massive problem. Um, and again, you can see here, this is some of uh, some of the information I had earlier. 
some of them went in there and they reinforced the base of the unit. So the first round of people who tried to fix these thought, okay, well, although it gets hot, I can go ahead and replace the rods and then I'll reinforce the bottom so that the rods come through again, it won't burn. Uh, when they did that, they still had problems with the rods burning through even stronger steels than it was. So at that point is when the industry decided we can no longer go ahead and use these. There's just way too much of a fire issue. They burn way too hot and you can't really go ahead and fix these. They should be replaced. This is my favorite one because you see these everywhere and I didn't learn about this until about four years ago. Rampart chimneys. The way you can tell it's a rampart chimney is the way it looks. So you can see that it looks like it's bricks. But realistically, you can tell that it's actually just gone ahead and it's been to, made, made to look like it's actual bricks. It is just a single piece of concrete that they pour into a cast and the cast has lines like a brick. And the idea was to give the aesthetic of a brick built uh, fireplace, but to do it much cheaper. The problem is with these ramparts um, is that the inside steel tube that contains the heat actually doesn't work. And over time, it'll go ahead and it'll start to dissipate the strength of the concrete. Also, another problem too is when these get cracks, they become porous and water can actually go and start storing inside of the concrete cast itself, costing it to way too much and rip away from the home. They will start to chip and break over time. Uh, sometimes you've seen people, I've seen a few where people actually go ahead and they put straps around their chimney because they've got large chunks that are coming off but there are large cracks. This again is something that has to be replaced. Average cost to tear down and replace for a two bedroom house is $20,000. 20,000. Yes, because yeah, well, because they have to rip, and I'm going to show you in a minute why too. Because this actually is the second part of the house they built. So they build the house, all the sticks, right, all the bones, as we say, all, all all the outside, all the frame. They then get this and they lean it up against it and they attach it to the house itself. So this is only being supported. All of its weights pulling off the house already to begin with. So when you see these rampart chimneys, um, I would be worried about it. Uh, I know home warranty won't go ahead and and back up anything on these as well. Uh, there's huge problems all the time and they're all over the place. Next time you guys are driving around, take a look and tell me if you see a rampart chimney. I guarantee you'll see one if you're driving there. What's that? Um, talking about probate, it's during the, the year, right? 71 to 89. Yeah, so now they don't do it. No, 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 no. Yeah, rampart chimneys. Yeah, this is the part of what they're doing now. Well, funny part too is a lot of houses aren't getting chimneys at all. So <laughs> there's that like out yeah. in Wildemere, they're building all the smart houses. There isn't a single chimney in the bunch. Who needs one in California? Yeah, it's, it's lately, that's for sure. So yeah, that's a problem. And like I said, the way you can really go ahead and, play and see this is just the way that it looks. So it looks like it's bricks, but realistically, it's just that concrete cast that's been poured. So here on this next one, we can actually see some of the problems. So this is that this first slide here with the red arrows, that's actually showing where the splitting is happening from the heat inside of that sleeve. So on the outside is that rampart chimney, is that concrete. On the inside is that steel sleeve. The steel sleeve doesn't work correctly. It heats up so much, it'll start to go ahead and break itself. It's actually a crack on its own, and then it'll start to break the actual chimney itself because of the expansion. Kind of similar, we talked about expansive soil earlier, or even the, uh, the, uh, the aluminum wiring, is it contracts and expands so much, but it's not meant to move. It wasn't built to move that much. So when it does, it starts to lose its uh, dexterity, and over time, we start to see cracking. The second one in, that's a very obvious crack. That's the one we see the most often. These are actually from reports we've done. That middle one is how about, I would say, 65% of them look when we get to properties. Once we get up on the roof, we're going to go ahead and see these cracks. You cannot fix that. Just think about if you drop a statue, you can, you can crazy glue it, but it's never going to be as strong as it once was because you broke the integrity of the entire mold. Uh, and then on the right side here, all the way to the end, that's what happens when water gets inside of these cracks. So you can actually start to see the steel casing on the uh, outside here to the left of it. But what happened here is the cracks are going over time. It was taken in moisture. And now you're actually starting to get uh, all four sides of the chimney start to peel off away from the steel uh, spine that it's built around. Uh, this picture here in the middle to the right, that's what it looks like when they put them together. They literally pour it in the cast. It's going to be on the ground. They're going to pull the chimney up against the bones of the house before the rest of the house is built. So just think about it this way. That is a concrete statue attached to a wood home. And that's the only thing keeping. There's nothing going around it. It's only going to be at the actual flesh points or, uh, yeah, flesh points where they're going to be able to connect it to the house. Um, and then once this goes, you're going to have to replace the entire thing. Absolutely. There's nothing with this. Uh, definitely, again, for us, a red line item of a warranty, I know, does not go ahead and back these up either. So this is a big issue. And again, it's one of the ideas of when we saw the housing boom kind of happen and people started building track homes, they wanted to build them faster and cheaper. And this was one of the ways. Instead of having a couple of people out there actually laying bricks, you can just go ahead and pull in a cast, prop it up against the house, and then uh, sell the house. And that was it. And then a few years later, you start to see the cracking. 
And these problems, I said, happen all the time. You see this all throughout Southern California, by the way, all throughout Southern California. Has anyone seen a rampart chimney before they can remember? Yeah, yeah now you know what it is, right? Because the minute you see that, you go, oh yeah, the fake brick one, looks nice. And then we realize that's what it is. It's really just concrete around um, a, a steel cage, which isn't actually strong enough to go and hold the temperatures of a fire. Do you know why it's called rampart? I don't know, that's a good question. I think it's just the company that made it, to tell you the truth. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Here we go. I look into that. Yeah, I don't know for 100% on that. I'm, but I'm guessing that's what it is. It's probably the company that first started doing it, or it could be the, um, considered the, um, the way that it's laid in the cast. It's, um, for Grand Park Chimney, for sure, you're going to have to redline that one. So are you saying that whatever house that has that Grand Park chimney, chimney most likely to have to be fixed? Uh, eventually they will, regardless. Yeah, but for us, we know that we don't know when that's going to happen. So we know that over time, we have to make them aware. You have a rampart chimney. So if we redline that, then what would happen is when we make that phone call, at that secondary conversation we have, and you, your uh, client may go, "Why did you write the chimney up? It looks fine to me." Where that's where we'd explain that's a rampart chimney. They've been known to have issues. We can't put a warranty on that, which so we have to make you aware that we, over time, feel like these are going to be a, a bigger issue. Uh, they're not they're not manufactured anymore for a reason. So yeah, we'd have to put it on there just to go and protect ourselves. Yes. As the inspector, you won't warranty it, but what if, do you know if the home warranty will warrant? I don't believe they will. Okay. Yeah, I don't believe they will. Just because it's so obvious of what's happening to it all the time and it's been so consistent. So, uh, so, 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 so if everything is reported and disclosures are all leading up, mm -hmm. then the buyer so that that disclosure and 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 progress, or you know, if you still want to buy the property, it's up to you, right? Oh, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're not we're not here. What we do is we're not here to sway it one way or another. We hope that all your deals close. Right. And we hope you use us in all your deals. Absolutely. But realistically, what we have to do is we have to abide by our insurance and our certifications. So our job really is to come in and say, here's the health of your investment. We look through your home. Here are some things that we think need some more attention. Recommend someone come take a further look. Like, so, for example, for the rampart, we recommend that a chimney sweep expert comes in or a foundationist comes in. Someone who's actually in the act of building sciences to come in and take a look. And then they would be the ones to go ahead and take on the liability because they may say, hey, it's fine. Just make sure they write that down and they give you their warranty because if, if a problem happens, that's the person who went ahead and advised your client as a professional that anything that we said needed to be looked at wasn't an issue. We just have to make sure that if someone comes to us later on and goes, why didn't you write about this or tell us about this? We need to make sure that we let them know, hey, this is something we've seen enough. I mean, we average about four, right now we're averaging about 480 inspections a week. So by doing that many inspections, we see so much more than other companies. So because we see that, we see a lot more consistency where the failures are at. We want to make sure we make people aware of them, especially a buyer, but even a seller too, because we don't want a seller to get in a position where they can be sued just because they didn't know because they weren't educated about their property prior to the, the sale. Make sense? Yes. All right. Thank you. Definitely. Now, here's the big one to me is the electric panels. Take a picture, whatever you want to do, write these down. Zinsco, Stablock, Sylvania, Federal Pacific they consistently time and time again fail um so like for a zinsco and stablock they are no longer in business but you can still buy the parts for them on um online so there's still someone manufacturing some of these parts but these are problems we have all of these panels have a huge reputation for being problematic it's been noted time and time and time again um if i see any of these there are also there are some sylvanias that we don't write up but for majority, um, these four brands, if that's on there, it's immediately going to be a red line item for us because the amount of failures that they have. And like I said, two of them aren't even made anymore. So if they're there, they can never be serviced correctly. And the parts are all going to be uh, second market hand. So we definitely want to make sure. And I have a picture in here of what happens when you use one of those. Um, so again, these are the companies that we're looking at. And here's our problem. That's what can happen with these, with these boxes. Uh, that last picture is actually somebody we went out three different times every time we went out the first two times the owner of the property said he forgot to turn electricity on the third time he turned it on that's what he came out to so i think he knew that he had an issue the box was running too hot and then as you can see it melted against the house itself and the problem that we have here too are the main bus connections so again we're going to get a lot of arcing they're not built very well um especially you know you put this with like a single wire aluminum i mean you're definitely going to get a meltdown so the problem here is that they weren't built correctly. And because of that, the electricity isn't actually being funneled up to the house correctly. A lot of it is heating up and taking it to the box and the box itself will overheat. So once the box overheats, GFI or not, you can still short out your entire house because that amount of electricity has been pulsating throughout the home, slowly going ahead and killing any of the other step locks that are supposed to be in the way to keep us from having any kind of blowout. Um, 
The breaker, again, the arcing at the breakers was a big time is overheating. Uh, massive fire hazard with these, but I would say more of the damage that we see is the inside of the house, the things that were plugged into the wall that didn't have surge protection, you know, computers, phones, TVs. Um, sometimes the, you know, enough power can come from these, it'll melt the sockets themselves too, because again, we're getting back to that arcing. And arcing is a huge problem when it comes to electrics. It's, it's unfounded, there's nothing you can do about it. There's no way to go ahead and, and fix it. You have to go ahead and replace the unit itself and then have the wiring redone. Um, this will always be something that will be written up. I know for home warranty, they do the same thing with a lot of these boxes. They have like a do not warranty list about some of the boxes that are out there. And it's going to be some of those brands. They may go a little further than we go because they probably had to go ahead and, you know, they've seen a lot of claims over time. But those are the ones for us that we have seen throughout our time in the 40 year history of the company uh, continue fail at a high enough rate that we feel that they should be changed out, especially for a buyer. We don't want them to move into this house and then they find out they have a bad box. Um, boxes, I would say to have them installed, you're probably looking in the neighborhood of about five, six thousand dollars. Have it done right. They would take off your old box, put in your new box. Um, if you have any damage from the old wiring, all those wires have to be replaced too. Um, if you're lucky enough that you just have a box that we recall, but there's no uh, damage to the wiring in the home, you could probably get away for a few grand and have a, have a new one installed that's going to be current, that's going to be more efficient, by the way, as well. And it won't, nearly, uh, won't run nearly as hot. And the arcing should also be taken care of, along with the warranty from the manufacturer now. So these are going to be outdated, um, older boxes. But again, if we see any of these, we need to call them out. If you guys run across them, just kind of keep in the back of your head that, hey, I saw a, a, a Zlinski panel or I saw a stab lock panel. And just know that if you're on the selling side, that could be something that comes up. And if you're on the buying side, I would bring it up just to see if they'd be willing to go ahead and maybe help with replacement on it, because you're going to have to replace it regardless, uh, especially if it breaks down too many times. There just aren't parts to go ahead and fix it. And I said, again, the overheating is a huge issue. Make sense? All right. All right, so for these exhaust pipes, um, these are mostly going to be in commercial buildings, um, even some restaurants, but also apartment complexes. So the problem here is with these exhaust pipes, it's the uh, ultra, yeah, the ultra vent HDPV uh, plex vent and plex vent two, is that they become porous. So as they heat up, they actually start to develop <laughs> little holes here and there, and they can leak out carbon monoxide. Um, the, another problem with these is they tend to be in higher spots in the home, so even the carbon monoxide will not get picked up by the uh, detectors. Um, again, it's super rare that you're going to see these in a home. Uh, we're going to see these in apartment complexes, multi dwelled units, and commercial as well. Uh, the problem, again, is that the pipe itself um, heats up too much, and as it heats up, it becomes porous. As it becomes porous, it pushes out poisonous gases such as CO2. Um, I don't think you're running into this one, quite honest with you, unless you do apartment complexes. Uh, older apartment complexes, this is pretty common. Uh, commercial, it's going to depend when it was built. Single family residences, I don't think we've ever seen one on a single family that I know of at least. Um, unless they get like maybe like an industrial uh, uh, range put in their home, like a big cooking pan, something along those lines. Or if they go ahead and get the house fan, which is like in the South County right now, people are getting those house fans, the fans that actually go ahead and they blow all the hot air off the, out of the house. Um, they have to have an exhaust as well. Um, I doubt those are gonna be in those systems, but those systems don't deal with heat as much as they do with just generating um, air movement. But again, if you see this right here, it's going to be pretty easy because it'll say like Plex Vent, Plex Vent 2, Ultra, uh, Ultra Vent HDPV. It's usually actually on the pipe itself. They will, they will go ahead and, and stamp their name on the pipe. So you should be able to find that one. If it's sticking out, I don't think you see a ton of it. But if you do see one of these, absolutely going to be redlined and has to be replaced. So this is now a question of safety. This isn't just something that's going to be like, well, I don't like it. It doesn't look good or it could damage over time. You know, carbon monoxide, the silent killer, as they say, right? So that's where the problem is with here is there's no way to go ahead and detect it unless you have a monoxide um, unit very close to it. <clears throat> this is my favorite one, cow shake roofs. These are all over the place. Um, maybe you guys have noticed them or haven't noticed them. Uh, cow shake roof is basically, <laughs> how can you say it? it's, it's like a concrete pancake. That's how they put them together. So it's made of concrete. It's made of picked up of other stones and whatnot. Uh, in the middle of it, there's actually a black piece of paper that says cow shake concrete on it. Uh, the problem with this is one, they're very brittle. Very, very, very brittle. They break all the time. The second problem we have with these is that they're porous. So they start to go ahead and take in moisture. So just think about this. If you had a cow shake roof and we have a massive rainstorm, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds has now been added to your house just because of the amount of water it can hold into these. Uh, we've had a house out in Glendora where someone had a cow shake roof and it was under a tree 
and the tree kept going ahead and dropping its leaves and it rained enough and over time he had a tree on his roof it became and i've got a picture of it next i still wish i would have walked into the attic because i was told the attic looked like um like an avatar like there are roots going from the attic but you see the top of it here so the cow shake group on um, um, you can't walk on them they'll break um, um over heat extension they will break uh the weight of just an antenna tipping over they will break uh, they tend to be installed incorrectly um, and again they're porous they take on a lot of water um, the lifetime for one of these roofs is very short but again kind of going back to this this common theme here it was very cheap at the time to use which is why it was used so much a lot of this in like um uh downtown los angeles not downtown los angeles to the east los angeles we see a lot of cal shaped roofs as well so here's a picture of what can happen so this picture on the left that is a roof that we went on to that no that they couldn't know it had ever been on. That was just how it had broken over time. And as you can see, as it breaks in against the shard, not one of those pieces that is broken um, is actually still affixed to the house. It's just laying there because of its weight. So if you want to go there, you could just pick it right up and put it right back down, which is a major problem. So here's the picture we're talking about in that gentleman's house in Glendora. So the tree dropped all his seeds and whatnot, and it went in there and it rained. And then on top of this, had a complete meadow for a roof. And on the inside of it, we had hanging roots from, from the actual plants themselves. So cow shake roof, we won't, even, we won't even walk on it. We will never certify it. Um, I won't give it a warranty. The minute I see it's a cow shake roof, I write it off automatically. Have a, you can have a roofer come out. We have our own roofing company with an elite called Rocket Roofing. We could take a look at it for you. But I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to recommend replacement. Absolute 100% replacement on a cow shake roof. And uh, usually it's going to come in gray, which is this color, or like that past light in that red. Those are the two common colors you're going to see in the most. And one of the things you can tell about, especially when it's the red, is when it starts to crack, is you can start to see the concrete. That's a really good way for you to tell if it's a cow shake roof right there, is the minute that nice pretty color is gone, you see that it's just a piece of curb, basically. <laughs> and then, like you said, the problem, the biggest problem that we see with these is um, the porous material and as it goes ahead and it gets more water retains more water holds more water it's putting stress on the house it's also going ahead and giving you a stronger chance of getting into mold and it's giving you a stronger chance of water damage because as it goes ahead and it becomes porous and holds on to that water and it puts the weight onto the actual house itself then that water starts to drain and it tends to go into the wood so that's why when we do an inspection we always really try to to have you guys make sure we can get in the attic because the attic actually gives us the best story of the roof because the roof around top of it, I mean, it looks like so much. I mean, it rains here, what, like three times a year, you know, so there's not a ton of time for us to see that. You can't really judge how, how good it's in the shape it's in um, as far as being able to uh, keep water out. But when we get under it, we can actually see if there's ever been any water staining, which would lead us to know, okay, there are, there are minor leaks here or this part of the house is leaking. Also, what we can do is you can see early signs of wood rot. And wood rot lets us know that although we don't see any drip signs or signs of staining water, we do know that somehow some water is getting into the eaves. The eaves are then drying out with the extreme heat of the summer. And then we're gonna go to what we call white wood. And basically once wood turns white, it's dead. There's nothing, there's nothing left to it. It's, it's gonna it just decaying on its own. It's becoming like a, like a hollow bone almost. Does that make sense? All right. Oh, did I touch something? There we go. All right, oh, too fast. There we go, okay. So now we're going into galvanized piping. Oh. Just kidding. Now we're going into galvanized piping. All right, so galvanized piping, again, um, we kind of talked about piping earlier. Uh, galvanized piping, it's not that it's a bad product. It just doesn't have a great long life. Um, and this was used quite a bit uh, back in like the 1930s or so. And um, it wasn't that it was a bad product, but it's just that once we get into you know the 2000s and whatnot, this has been around so for a very long time and it's starting to break down. So what we will see basically on the lifespan of this is we're gonna to start to go ahead and see the inside starts to rot. As you see in this picture over here, all the corrosion. There's actually a plastic tube inside of this. Once that plastic tube is penetrated with water, that's when the decay begins. Uh, we're gonna to start to see rust spots on the outside of it as it's rusting all the way through. So unlike that PV piping we saw earlier, we kind of see you break, we'd see little leakages here. This actually will physically start to corrode. So for example, these spots here that are brown, you could go ahead and, and if you had a, a small tack hammer and hit it, it would blow right apart. It's completely rotted out and it's done. Uh, the first signs you're gonna see about this are usually gonna be brown water or tinted water as we call it. 
So you start to turn your water on, you notice oh, it looks just a almost like watered down iced tea, maybe not super strong, but we start to see a little yellow, a little gold or a little brown. That's because the inside of the pipe that's actually decayed is now being pushed out through the system itself. That's usually our first sign. Um, it was used a lot. Uh, again, this is something that if we see it, we have to go ahead and write it up immediately. Um, I would recommend it gets replaced with copper. I would never tell my buyer that or seller that because then I'm guiding them what to do. I would recommend a plumber comes in and takes a further look. And to me, any good plumber would say, you should go ahead and get these taken out and put in copper. Now you could put in a different type of galvanized if you want, but again, you're only gonna get so much time on that. So it's kind of what you, you get what you pay for kind of idea. Uh, this is something that's gonna be hard to see. Uh, if you do, sometimes there are capital G's actually stamped into the uh, pipe itself, which might help go ahead. If you guys see it yourself, you could say it's galvanized. But in general, we're gonna be able to know pretty quickly if it's galvanized piping. And this is something that has got to be replaced. There's no way I can go and give any kind of warranty on this. Uh, home warranties themselves, I've heard both story, both sides of it, if they go ahead and actually work with galvanized piping or not. I believe it has to be disclosed up front as part of what the idea is, because a lot of times what we see is galvanized piping over the years is any piping that's showing is copper. Anything it's not showing, they kept galvanized. So you get the look of copper, and, it, and you may think it's copper throughout, but actually it's going to be the parts that you can visually see. The rest of the home is still under the galvanized piping uh, order. Uh, tube and knot wiring, we don't see a ton of this. This is going to be craft homes, downtown Pasadena, Old Town Orange, um, some parts of Santa Ana, uh, some parts of like East LA. So parts are people have lived for a long time and then they've built around. Knob and tube wiring is what was used back in the day for electricity. It's not a problem. The only problem with it that we have is that we have too much need. So our electronics require so much power that knob and tube can't control it. They don't, they don't have the output to give. Not a fire hazard not going to hurt anybody. Um, you don't even have to remove it from the property. If you don't want to remove it, you can just keep it there, but you're going to have to rewire the property. It is rare that we see any of this still intact, but the problem happens is when people don't know what it is, they freak out. And I'll show you a picture here in a second of a house in Pasadena where they had the traditional knob and tube wiring. They actually bought the house anyways. They kept the knob and tube wiring and they made a reading area up in the attic just running a single light bulb. And it's, it's, it's such a, it's a weak system that it actually pulsates, the white light pulsates, because it can't even go ahead and run a current light bulb. It doesn't have that kind of power. When this was installed back in the day, this was just going to be for a few lamps. Um, and that was really about it. There was maybe a radio. There wasn't a lot of, a lot of electrician, uh, sorry, electricity being needed in the average home when this knob and tube wiring was used. Um, there's usually going to be two kinds. There's one that's going to be underground. Um, for that one, the only way you could really notice is if you see a, um, any kind of wiring going from the ground up to the fuse box, or they'd actually go ahead and string it along the um, attic of the home. I got some pictures here to show you. So this is that house in Pasadena. So this is really what it looks like. It's just a little tiny, it's a little tiny power grid. But back then the technology wasn't very good. So that's what it took to go ahead and get just enough power for a few lights in the house on the radio. That's how much knob and tube wiring they had to give. Um, again, it's, there's no fire hazard here. It's not a problem. Um, it can be unsightly, or unsightly rather, which I think that's more, most of what people don't like about it. Um, but regardless of what you do or how you modify the system, it will never be strong enough to go ahead and run modern electric uh, items in the homes that we have now. Foundations, we're seeing a lot of this now, a lot of this lately we're running into. Uh, so foundations, these are the three type of foundations right here that we have the biggest problems with. Um, this first one here is going to be a cripple wall. So basically that wall um, is the foundation. And then those wood panels that go up, there should be bars going across those wood panels. Because as that shakes a little bit, the uh, actual foundation itself, the wood will start to snap. And then we'll start to go ahead and have issues, pressure issues in the house. That's you get sagging or you get tilted floors is because basically it has not been reinforced. So when we see anything like this, like with a cripple wall, we're looking for massive enforcements, reinforcements on this. This house had zero enforcements. We weren't able to go ahead and let it pass. Uh, second is going to be the brick. Now, traditionally what they do is they put down rebar, they slide the bricks down, they build that way. But some of the older homes you run into, it literally is just brick and mortar, brick and mortar. It's, all, it's just stacked. And that's the foundation of the home. The problem here is it's not meant to move. So when it does move, you can't replace it because now you've got a whole part, that whole part of the wall, not only is it gone, but now the stress points have gone out. So you've changed the stress points. Everything that that was manufactured to do has been changed. For them to do that, usually what they do is they'll come in with very, very large pieces of wood, 
slide them under the house, and they start to slowly knock out the foundation all around and rebuild it. So if we see a brick and mortar, and these ones are usually going to be easy to see because it's going to look a little sloppy, tends to be, and not, not going to be not these beautiful angles like we like, not these great right angles and smoothness. Um, and you're going to be able to see the gaps, the, the space between the bricks usually is not perfect um, because you can't see this kind of stuff that has rebar in it. The one that's just the, the uh, brick walls that have rebar in it, or the brick foundations rather, are totally fine. There's no issue with those because they've got a center uh, with that rebar, but they won't shift too much. Uh, finally is the river rock one, which is one of my favorites, actually. I think it looks really pretty, but um, if it's not done correctly and it isn't reinforced, it's just the same problem you have here with the brick walls, except for now it's going to be sideways. So traditionally, how they would actually go ahead and build these is they would build sleeves around the house. They would start to put rocks in and they would start to put cement in and put rocks in and cement in. And that's how they would go ahead and build it up until it was done. So again, we don't have anything in the center to go ahead and keep this from moving back and forth. So when it starts to break, the pressure points of the weight of the house get dispersed out and you have sections of the foundation taking on more weight than they were meant to do and other sections not taking any weight at all, which can go ahead and start to give us some floor issues. But overall, what we're going to see is the actual home itself will probably start to shift and sag in some certain parts. So if I see any one of these three, I will have to bring it up as an intention. And even if it's in great shape, I just want someone to come out there, those foundations to go ahead and say, oh, this is fine or this isn't fine. Again, I can't go ahead and say if it's great or not great until we really look into the foundation of it. A foundation expert is going to know exactly what's happening, and they can actually do pressure point tests as well to find out where the house is uh, sagging or, or actually rising in some cases as well. Um, so it's beautiful. It looks great. The river rock, but unfortunately, it's not the strongest of the foundations out there. And if we see these kinds of problems, we're going to have to go ahead and put them on that report in that red line. All right, signs of moisture. Now, this one is kind of a basic one. I really couldn't figure out the best way to say, well, look for this, this, and this. So what I thought is just to show you guys what we see that we know is a problem. So do you guys remember earlier when I talked about possible wood rot and how the wood would turn white and basically be like a hollow bone? That's what all this is. All this wood is done. So what had happened is they'd had a flood and they'd gone ahead and they said they were all taken care of and they fixed it and did everything they're going to do. So what I did is I got my toy here, which I'll let you guys play with in a minute. This is my infrared gun. And what this does, is this reads temperature. So I can go ahead and put this on an item. And if I see that it's a dark color, I know that it's colder. If I see a bright color, I know it's warmer. So if I go ahead and I look at this, it looks very dry. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. But then we put on our gun. Everything that's purple is showing moisture. That's showing me that it's got a temperature change. And this thing is so, sorry, Zoomers, you're going to miss on this one. This thing is so sensitive. So for right now, can everybody see that's orange? Mm -hmm. Just by putting my finger here for a second, it'll pick up my heat trace. There you go. Oh, wow. There's the middle. So by having something like this on our arsenal, when we go ahead and we look into homes, we're able to go ahead and get a better idea of exactly what we're dealing with without having to tear walls apart, without having to go ahead and put holes in anything. So that's what we're seeing here. So the signs of moisture is white wood. When you see this white wood, that's a good sign that there has been a major part of water damage. At some point, water was all over this part of the home, whether it was completely submerged or just sat there for a long time. This isn't like somebody spilling a cup of water. This is like a sink running overnight, or this is like a burst pipe. Once it dries up, now we know that all of this wood here has lost its integrity and should be replaced. The top picture, what that is, that's basically a roof that got flooded. And when we went ahead and they took the uh, actual particle board and went off for it, that's what we saw. And all of those little flaps at one point were little bubbles of water because it's so much water had come, then it finally had burst. And that was the leftover uh, paper that was hanging. So if you ever see anything like that, where it looks kind of torn up a little bit, know there has been water damage at one point there. White wood, water has been a, a problem there as well. And then here on the right-hand side, um, you can see a little bit of white wood. It's also a warped floor. I couldn't get a good picture, but the floor itself was warped as well. And that's when using guns like that, the, like the infrared gun that I just handed you guys around, that gives us a better idea of what we're dealing with. So for example, if your client was to say, hey, or the seller, let's say, Hey, um, I noticed on the report, you guys said that I had a bunch of water damage in the hallway. That flood was 17 years ago. We took care of it. We've never had an issue. Well, that's where we can go ahead and we can show them some of the things we've used. Well, our infrared gun is picking up moisture, for one. Also, we see white wood, so we know the wood itself is actually decayed and needs to be replaced. And this gives us a better idea to let us understand what the house has been through, but more importantly, the current condition that it's in. Because if I was going to move into a home and everything looked fine, and then I saw this on the underneath part, I'd be pretty upset knowing what I know at least, that that has to all be replaced because over time this is going to become a problem. This is the part, this is like the movies and someone falls through the roof upstairs and you see your legs kicking. This is the kind of issue that would happen from that. 
because the wood is so, so, it's dried out, it's dead, and the integrity of it's completely gone. Yes? So what, do you, what part of the house do you use to find that moisture indication more? So it's usually two areas. Usually it's the attic, and then it's going to be if we can get under the house. So if I can get under the house, that's my number one. I, I love houses I can get under because it gives me a really good story. Um, outside of that, I would say laundry rooms. We see a lot of water damage in laundry rooms. So people would have the hookups inside the house, not that, not the actual garage. You know, that's where we see a lot of problems there. And usually that's because there's been a leak there. It wasn't installed properly. Um, another problem we get too is when people go ahead and they run the uh, drying with the door closed, it gets very damp in there. And that water just sits there. Like if you ever, I don't know if you ever been to somebody's house or your house where the washer dryer is in the bathroom. And if they run the dryer and you walk in, how it feels like humid in there and moist, because all of that water that's been drying up is still in the air in that small area. And even if they run the fan, chances are it's not going to pick all of it up, which is why you're supposed to use a different paint in bathrooms too, is because the steam um, can penetrate some other paints and can give you some water damage as well. So that's why there's usually different color paint, uh, paints for rooms that are going to have uh, any kind of moisture in the air. Answer your question? Yeah, so you create the space. So if you have a dryer and you have an AC, you, 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 you create a little space or there be a... No, you need, you need a fan. <laughs> you need a big fan. So what happens is some of these houses have the washer and dryer in the bathroom, right. but the fan is still the regular fan for the bathroom. Like in case, you know, some, something you know, happens you don't want to smell or whatever, you know, whatever, what a fan would be for in a bathroom. But when you have a large unit, it's tumbling and it's creating and it's spinning out all of that, that water and that air and that moisture air. And it's only got that small fan. It just isn't anywhere for it to go. So usually it's just not enough strong. The fan isn't strong enough in those situations. So you expect the attic? Yes. Not the laundry and the... If we can get under the house, absolutely. There's some houses that we can't get under because there's no way to get under them or because when they were built, people were, weren't quite as rotund as myself. And we've got these small little, small little areas to get in. So that's why when we go ahead and we get the address from you, we try to look it up real quick, because if we see there's a possibility to get under the house, we want to try to send out an inspector that is going to be a little thinner to be able to get under some of these smaller, some of these small, yeah. I mean, even the doorways, right? In some of these older houses, the doorways are very thin. It's just, it's just people weren't, you know, people weren't, people weren't me yet. <laughs> I've been homeless back then if I had to, they don't house my size. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and go under, see everything that we can. But we're really going to be looking for areas for moisture is going to be sinks, bathrooms, tubs, and then we hopefully we can get under those and on top of those, which is why in the attic, we try to go to all the corners of the attic, because we want to try to see is there any damage coming up from the from the uh, master bathroom, uh, bathroom rather, or if there's a um, laundry room, we want to try to get above that. Do we see anything that are showing any kind of water damage? Is there um, any kind of excess moisture being uh, sucked in by the house? Do we need a stronger fan? So we're going to go through the entire house, but we're always looking for moisture. How can the laundry create the moisture to the ceiling? So as it's going ahead, if you've ever been inside, like I said, if it's a small room and they turn on their dryer and there's a dryer spitting out, it's hot and moist air. So it's going to rise. And Do they have an exhaust already? Yeah, it doesn't always work. That's what I'm saying. It's because all times a small room. So the exhaust may not work. The fan may not work. That's where we see most of it. So I'm not talking about if you go into like a house where um, there's a little laundry room before you hit the kitchen. I'm talking about places like the actual bathroom might have a stack unit, but it's the, the washer dryer in the bathrooms. Because what they do is they're only, they only have that fan, and the chances are that that exhaust has to go out through the house. They're probably not by the corner of the house. So now we have that long tube. It has to go out. We've got to hope that all that's going to be getting kicked out. Plus, is it clean? A lot of these, when you go in there, are just impacted with lint. Yeah, just picture an extended humidity. Exactly. Yeah, just like you take a hot shower and you close the door. And it's, like I remember I went to a hotel not that long ago, and I took a hot shower, and the whole ceiling had droplets coming down. Yeah. Because it, it just no didn't, ventilation. yeah, exactly, exactly what it was. And I had the fan on, it wasn't strong enough, but I mean, it was like a, like a rainforest in there. You'll see that a lot in like Mexico and you know, in Michigan. Yeah. Oh yeah, the South in the summer is gross. That's why it's good to put the one supply in the garage. I agree. I understand why, how it's, I understand the easy part of having the house and I get that, but the problems, I had a house uh, years ago and I had um, my washer and dryer in the guest bathroom and it was a full set. And one morning I was like, man, it looks weird. It looks weird. And this big bump started coming out on the kitchen side. And that's exactly what it was. I had a massive leak in there and it just kept going and going and going. It's because it were, but because of where it was set and the, the first thing the person came to fix it told me, they're like, this is a horrible design. This water's got nowhere to drain. Like it's, what, you know, it's supposed to be towards the end of the house. Not in the, I mean, you know, think about the guest bathroom of an average home. It's right in the middle of the house, right? Mm -hmm. So that means all the pipe has to go out super far. I'm not next to the vent where it should be like in the garage where it can kick right on out to the side yard usually. 
So placement's a big part of it too. All right. So, all right, this is just a picture that I put up there. Um, I just think it's a, it's a cool little thing. If you ever want to take a picture of it, people ask us, um, you know, what would what, what you inspect me to do at home? Here, let me see if I can get rid of this thing on the bottom. What, it's like, they always ask me, what do you, uh, there we go. They always ask me, you know, when you guys uh, do a home inspection, what do you guys look at? I get that all the time. So my running joke, I go, we just check door handles. That's it. <laughs> so yeah, we look at the entire house. Um, you know, the average person in their lifetime in America buys two houses. So they haven't gone through this a lot. They don't really know much about it. So a lot of times we have to go in there and kind of remember, they don't know anything about what we do. So we got to really go ahead and, and educate them on exactly what we're going to get done. Um, again, all of my inspectors are car certified. So the same institution that's given your licensing has gone ahead and background checked all 80 of mine. Um, I've got women, I've got men, I have Spanish speakers, Korean speaker, mm -hmm. Tongan, um, ex-military. So there's always something there. If there's somebody that you have, if there's a, you, know, you get a, a, a client and you think they need to work with somebody who's been in the military or they prefer a woman mm -hmm. or they prefer a Spanish speaker, let me know. because so I wanna line you up with the best possible way to have the best possible transaction. They're all trained across the board. They've got the same training. Some have done it longer, absolutely. But in general, they've all passed the same. They have to do 120 hours of continuous classroom work every year to keep your licensing with us. So we stay on top of them. It is like once you get into elite, you're good forever. You still have to go ahead and you have to pick up everything we pick up. Mold certifications, commercial certifications, sewer camera certifications. So, yes. All right. So before I hop into some of the materials, are there any questions from anybody? Yes. yes. Uh, you mentioned about moisture and trash conclusion. Who would you call as a specialist or who would you tell your the homeowner you're referring them to so they can so I have to see what kind of how bad it was. So because um, there's usually two people we're going to go either HVAC nine times out of ten is where we're going to look at that, um, or we're going to go ahead and look into like an environmental company because like I have one called Titan who I work with all the time because when there's moisture there's that one word we never say we didn't say it in here right because there's no clients but the biggest thing we worry about is mold right because now we're like oh my gosh how bad is this has it fed you know and kind of a side note too with mold. Whatever you see on the outside of a wall, on the inside of the wall, it's two times higher. The colonies usually start on the inside and they spread and then they go out. So that's one of the reasons you never want to go ahead and say, oh, just clean that up a little bit, or oh, just, oh, just a little bit, because we don't know. I mean, we can get in there and it could be the entire wall, but because we said it's a little now liability, we could be sued. So that kind of depends on the amount of moisture and where is it at, where it's at. And that's something too, with our reports, at least, if you ever had a referral issue, you just call them, hey, Dustin, you guys said that there's a massive problem with moisture who you recommend to reach out to and definitely can give you some to reach out to. But again, it'll depend on the kind of moisture, the amount and where it's located in the home. Any other questions? How much? How much? There it is, a buying question, I love it. All right, so let's hop onto this real quick. We're off onto the, uh, to the, our trifold here. Uh, basically the way that it works out, this first page talks about the 1800 point inspection. That's our elite inspection. Starts off at $419 for the first 1500 square feet, $419 for the first 1,500 square feet. Right After that, what's that? Right now, the price went up. Yeah, well, it's, everything went up, right? Yeah, it's costing us more to roll wheels, it's costing us more to keep our insurance, yeah. Um, but still a great, still great service, I'll say that, I'll say that. Um, yeah, so 419 for the first 1,500 square feet. Um, and then as the house gets larger, the price will go up. It's always based on square feet. Um, you do get that 1,800 point inspection. You also get 100 days. So 100 days from the time we leave the property, if there's anything that we missed or anything we misdiagnosed, we'll be able to take care of it for you. What about a real inspection? You know, when you find something that needs to be corrected, you, you go back to the charge? No, it's there. There's a charge that was come back out. And how much is the $200. Yeah, $199. Yes. Yes. Now, if that's a, now, I, I will say this, and I tell everybody, Zoomers too, if you have a client, and money is a real issue, let me know. I would hate not to give someone the best inspection experience because I couldn't work on price a little bit. Now, it's not something I can do every single client, but if you have someone who's like, you know, this house is only $200,000, $200 and, you know, kill them, we could probably find somewhere around that to get it to a smaller amount just to make sure that they're happy with what they got and that they got the most complete inspection. Now, you were saying that inspect, uh, to be an inspector, you don't need a license? State of California has no licensing available. Okay, so you were saying that, um, of course, you train your staff, and how many hours do you get up? It's 120 uh -huh. to first go ahead and get into the academy. Then it's going to be three months of doing condos as shadowing someone else, then three months of condos by themselves, then two months of single family residences with their trainer. And then after that, they'll be able to work on their own. 
but they have to do 120 hours of re-education every year as well. So all the certifications they get through InterNACHI, which is the company that we got our certification through, um, every year you have to update your, you have to take the test all over again. You don't just have a one-time thing. So it's a continuous education process as well. Okay. I know you mentioned that um, you do like 400 something a month. Have you a week. Seen, I mean a month, a week. Have you seen the business slow down because of what's going on right now? Absolutely, about 20%. Yeah. Okay. So we were averaging right around 550 to 560 for about almost two years. And then this year was we first start. Now we're averaging, I would say, right around 475. 475, 480, kind of depends. You know, a couple of 500 spike here and there, but yeah, we've definitely seen it slow down a bit. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, no problem. Uh, second page here, or yeah, the, the spine, if you will, that's called the Elite Plus package. So whatever you go ahead and um, book your inspection for, based on the square footage, you simply just add an additional $150. And what we'll do, give me one second. So for that, the Elite Plus, when you go ahead and you get into the Elite Plus package, uh, what you're going to get here now is we're going to give you five years leak protection on the roof. If the roof passes inspection, we're going to go ahead and send a PDF to your client on how to keep your home uh, in better shape to last longer written by an inspector. We're going to inspect the uh, um, sprinkler system now, all the irrigation. We're also going to go ahead and give you the repair pricer. That's a secondary report we can manufacture to give you the estimated cost to fix the problems we found during our original inspection. That's all part of that $150 upgrade called the Elite Plus package. The last page here, this is all of our auxiliary services. So these are services you can either add on to an existing home inspection or have done on their own. Uh, we're starting off with that sewer scope. So a sewer scope is when we're going to put a camera uh, down the, uh, the outtake of the house, all the way down to hopefully all the way out to the city line. And we're looking for things like root intrusion. Um, has the pipe cracked? Has the pipe moved? Um, has it improper connections? We're going to give you the health of that system. The reason I always go ahead and push these is because if this breaks, you don't know until you see it, smell it, or step in it. It's an underground pipe that breaks. So you're not going to be able to know. You're still going to flush your toilet, no problem at all. You're not going to see an issue there. You're not going to see a water pressure issue. There's going to be a crack that seeps into your property of that water leaving you of your home. And, and how much is the sewer um, scope inspection? $225 to add on to an existing ins inspection or $275 to be done by itself with no inspection. Okay. And you're also going to get a separate report on this. And the coolest thing about this is we actually film what we do. And then we send that, that, uh, that film to your clients so they can actually see what we saw. So instead of us going, oh, just trust me, 12 feet down, there's a problem. We can actually show them the video shot at their property of exactly what we found during our investigations to accompany a separate report as well with pictures inside of it. I'm going to ask you more questions. Please. I used to do the legal lines in a different industry than I am now. But I have a question. Do you, when you do the inspection, let's say somebody requests a lead inspection or a lead plus. When you're when one of your coworkers is out there, do they sometimes recommend, you know, um, about getting a sewer scope inspection? Let's say you go to a house in Pasadena, and you know the Pasadena is known for their beautiful trees. Oh yeah. And there's trees around the house. Do you sometimes recommend to the to the customers, hey, you know, based on looking at the house and a lot of trees? We will sometimes based on two things. One is if that, that particular inspector has a sewer camera with him, because we have done it in the past where we didn't have the camera with us and it kind of agitated the buyer or the seller because they were ready to say yes and then we didn't have it. And two is the agent, because we have some agents who tell us, do not try to upsell when you're here. We have other agents who say, tell them everything they need. So it kind of depends on that. Traditionally, we would go ahead and bring it up. We would just want to bring it up in the idea of like, you should do this. We would say, oh, by the way, we also do sewer scopes and given the trees, might not be a bad idea. Very soft. Because again, we don't know. But now we do have agents who will say, get out there and tell them everything that you guys do. Because I want them to say yes or no. But I don't think they're aware that you do that. Um, like termite is one of the things all the time people don't realize we do termite. So then they're going, oh, I didn't know you guys did termite. I paid for somebody else. So it's kind of a thin line we have to walk because we definitely don't want to get there and start trying to pitch and sell up to a prospective buyer or seller just because we don't know where their attitude is at and how you've had to work with them. We don't want to step on that part of the transaction. No, um, I, I was under the assumption, and maybe you could help me on this if I'm, if I'm new in the business. Isn't most home inspections required, like do the, 
termite as part of the inspection? No. No, it's no? it's completely. Yeah, city of California to as is regardless. So pretty much they can do what they want, when they want, how they want. And that's why the problem as an agent, you really have to make sure you cover your side of things. So for example, not to scare you, but if, uh, if uh, during the inspection process is coming and your buyer goes, I don't want an inspection and they go to the car forms and they sign off, I don't want an inspection. They then move in the house and they feel there's a lot of problems. They can still take you to court and say, you didn't explain to me how important an inspection was. So even though they signed off on not wanting an inspection, they can still take you to court under a liability law, which is why I always recommend if they waive an inspection, then go ahead and draft another email on your own saying, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I understand that you don't want to do an inspection. You send the car paperwork. I just really want to let you know, I strongly urge you to do so. And if you don't, you guys understand, you could go ahead and find problems later on. Just reply in this email that you understand where I'm coming from. So I just care about you guys or whatever it's going to be. They go, yeah, we still don't want one. Now you're covered. Because now you can go to court. Your, your Honor, I did what I had to do legally through car, and I went above and beyond and explained them personally how, as a professional real estate, I think they should do it. And they said no again. Then you're covered. But yeah, a lot of the double things have to happen, unfortunately. Do you have a, an actual um, buyer or something? The buyer prices on everything? No, they don't have anything like because, that. Because, for instance, how much does it cost to get someone? inspection to do 125 dollars for the first three thousand square feet and that's not available online no i don't know that since i've been the company for four years now they've never published pricing so i've asked for believe me i've asked for it a hundred times even my job so much easier but i will tell you this though you got my card now and i answer my phone all the time so i'd be more than happy to go ahead and help you with any kind of pricing you can do but unfortunately they, they don't provide that uh, so the sewer inspection again uh, 225 to add on to an existing inspection or 275 to be done on its own uh, just like our regular report, you're going to get the report back within 24 hours, usually that night. Uh, second one down is air quality testing. This is one of the ways we test for mold. So there's two ways we can test for mold. One is we get this machine, we plug the machine in, and it's like a living lung. It actually breathes in, and it'll read the particles in the air and give us a readout of what it's found. This is usually going to be used when people feel like there's a smell in the house or if they've seen any spore growth on the actual vents, so we know it's probably in the system. Uh, the second thing we can do for the testing is actually uh, physically go ahead and take swabs of what suspected mold is, send it to a uh, laboratory, and they'll send us back an entire feed out of the kind of mold, if it is mold, that was found in the home. So those are the two ways we can go. That starts off at uh, $3.99 for that. That will give you two samples. If you want to go into the whole house, it's 30 cents per square foot. I highly recommend if you're going to go for the mold not to do the whole house. It's so rare that we find a house that is full of mold. It's usually at spot areas. So just a way to go ahead and kind of think about that. Uh, then we have the request for repair pricers. That's that secondary report that gives you the estimated cost to fix the problems we found during our initial, uh, initial inspection. That's $75. It does take 72 hours to get though. I usually get it in 48, but it does take 72 usually and weekends do not count. So that's a really important one. So anytime that you go ahead and you place one of these in myself or my assistant, Julia, whoever uh, you speak with, we're going to continue to tell you guys that because we want to make sure if we've got a small contingency period and we can't get them inside that contingency period, we'd probably say, I wouldn't recommend doing it because I don't think it's going to be here in enough time. So that's one of those things to kind of keep your, your, uh, your eye on that one there. Uh, pool and spa inspections, whether it's a pool and a spa or a pool or a spa is $99. And what we're doing there is we're looking at the filtration, we're looking at the skimmer if it's available, we're looking at the heating system, we're looking at the lights. If there was a large crack in the pool, we'd recommend that a pool foundationalist or a pool production agent comes and takes a look at it. We're looking at the functionality of the pool itself, not actually the physical cracks. We would go ahead and be able to notice them, but we couldn't give you more information than say, have a pool contractor come out and take a deeper look at that. We don't do fountains, by the way. There has been a big rush lately. People have these massive fountains. Uh, I work in, uh, I, I know, I worked in Beverly Hills for a few, uh, a few days last week and I got a bunch of business out of there and all these people have fountains they want us to look at. And I was like, I can't look at your fountain. So I apologize for that. And I don't have a fountain guy yet either. If you know a fountain guy, let me know. Mm -hmm. But it's really tough to find someone who's willing to go ahead and actually deal with these fountains. Um, so unfortunately, fountains aren't covered there. A drone inspection. This is going to be for houses that have tile roofs. So we do not walk tile roofs. I can still go ahead and put up ladders and go all around the perimeter. We can use our uh, radiation, or, um, um, our gun here to go ahead and pick up any of the signs. We can take pictures. Um, however, if you do get a roof certification, which we'll talk about here in a second, roof certification, I'll walk any roof there is to make sure I can certify it. But as far as a basic inspection, if you wanted to get a better look at a tile roof, for $75, we actually get a drone, we fly above it, and we videotape the entire roof itself. 
we evaluate it, and then we give that video to your client, and we go over that with them as well. Why even one to one? They crack all the time, nonstop break, nonstop break. Um, and one of the things, and last one here real quick, is a reinspection fee. If I come out to a property and there's no electricity, there's no water, there's no gas, I can't gain access, whatever it may be, if I can't get my inspection done, you want me to come back out again, it's an additional $200, which is why we always want to make sure that we have all those things taken care of. So for the roof, uh, a few years back, uh, I had just started, it's about four years ago, we had a house out in a Palm Springs, a nice, beautiful custom house, and we walked the roof, the tile roof. And around the chimney, they had different color tiles. And one of our guys stepped on it. He broke the tile. It was a tile from like Italy. It was like five grand for like, I don't know, it's four and a half feet of tile. So that's when we're like, we're done. We're done. We're done, man. Part of it too is um, they can be dangerous. You know, that's part of it too. So if we get up there, like when we have newer people that get on, get on here, they have to work with their um, mentors because they need to understand, never be in a rush. You know? So what we do is all of our inspectors live all over the state. And what we do is try to give them jobs specific to their area. So one, they know the area. They might know some of the housing, some of the differences. But also, we don't ever want them to rush through a job because they're thinking about traffic on their drive home. We want them to be like, hey, I'm going to get home in a reasonable time. I don't have to worry about that kind of traffic. So like in the mountain areas, you've got some guys, beach areas. Um, there's certain parts of Big Bear where you can have open exposed walls. Other parts, you can't have open exposed walls. And they know those differences. So we try to get that done. All right, moving on quickly here to the, uh, the postcard. This is just kind of a breakdown of what we do of our roof certification uh, program. Uh, so basically, the roof certifications are anywhere from two to six years. We start off as low as $275, going up to $675, um, and they stay with the roof. So if you have any investment clients or people who flip houses, this is an automatic easy sell. Because all you have to say is, hey, for $475, you can put a four-year roof on this house. So when you're selling this house and people come in, you can say, oh, yeah, we put in can lighting and new paint. And oh, by the way, the roof is certified for four years. So let's say that you buy a four year roof certification and two years later, you move out of the house. The next occupants in that house get the remaining two years. So regardless of who lives there, their certification stays with the roof that was purchased against. Uh, back on the other side here is just a more of a drawing about how the um, sewer camera works. That sewer line that we've been around out there kind of gives you an idea of exactly what we do. And if you guys want any more of these, let me know. And I can give you some physical copies if you want to have them on your person. Um, and then finally, what we're going to do is go ahead and look at this card. I apologize for the way it looks. That's just what I look like. What are you going to do? Can't do much about it. That's just genetics. Sorry. That's, how, that's why I bring chicken. So uh, basically what I want you guys to do here is go ahead and email. I'm sorry, text me your email address. Text me your email address with your name. Then I'm going to send you a digital copy of that trifold so you can send it out to prospective clients. And I'll send you some digital copies about um, roof certifications as well. So feel free to text me with any questions you have or call me. But again, if you could shoot me your email, I can get you digital copies of everything that you saw today. Um, that's pretty much it, guys. You, that was a big 12 today that we went over. Are there any questions? Any questions from anyone? I've been using your company. So Thank you. My clients like this kind of I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much for that. All right. Look at that. I love it. Awesome, awesome, yeah, thank you. If, 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 you're, if your questions arise later, you, you have his card, so. Absolutely, yeah. please. And does anyone want to take a picture before we go? Anyone? No. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm gonna that. end it. I don't like that. The first, it's perfect.